Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast Show. You are listening to the first and only podcast dedicated to the business of pharmacy. You can find all of our episodes at PharmacyPodcast.com. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast. I'm your co-host in 2017, focused on your career development, Aaron Albert. More on me at my website, AaronAlbert.com. Today, we continue our phenomenally successful mini-series on Back to School Rx, where we're focused on pharmacists and healthcare professionals returning to school to explore different career avenues. Today's guest is not a pharmacist, however, he is a man of the world. AJ Feeney Ruiz graduated both with his JD and MBA here in Indianapolis and now is in Paris, France, studying and learning how to be a chef. And in this era of functional medicine and all of your posts over at LinkedIn, several pharmacists commented that they wanted to learn more about the culinary arts. So I couldn't think of a better person to chat with. So AJ and I have a conversation coming up about his experience at Le Cordon Bleu in Paris and what he's up to in terms of the culinary arts. Give us a listen and thanks for listening today. All right, I'm AJ Feeney Ruiz. I'm an international adventurer and aspiring chef and you're listening to The Pharmacy Podcast. AJ, welcome to The Pharmacy Podcast. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So. You, we were talking offline, you're probably one of the coolest guests I've ever had the opportunity to interview on this podcast, and you have such a varied background. You're not a pharmacist, but the first question I always like to start with is, with all guests, how did you get to where you are today? I, I'll try to give you the, as short of an answer as possible Okay. that. Uh, I worked in politics and government. Um, as well as uh, on a couple of businesses like entrepreneurship. Um, but I worked in politics and government primarily for about 20 years. Started very young, I was a you know teenager. Um, first paid job, I was 17. First campaign I was running, I was about 23, 22. So I uh, really kind of just went after it. <laughs> and uh, about 20 years later, I was just really burned out and I was done and um, kind of was able to look back at my career and see that I had, I felt like I had accomplished uh, plenty in that time and decided it was time to move on from that to something different. And I uh, ran a campaign for Congress. We won. I received an offer uh, for a job and I politely declined it and said, they asked me, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I really don't know, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do this anymore. And I'm going to just sort of see what the universe throws my way and uh, go with that. So I kind of sat around for a uh, couple of months and explored some different career options, um, some nonprofit work, um, going back to school, just different options. And nothing really was kind of jumping out at me. And one of my uh, close friends in Indianapolis, where I'm from, <clears throat> uh, talked to me and, and explained that he was going to be leaving his job soon. And his father was a consultant in Beijing. And his father was encouraging him to go out to China and study Shaolin Kung Fu with uh, some former monks in the mountains of the Hunan province in the middle of nowhere, China. And so my buddy said, hey, you're not doing anything right now. Uh, you've studied martial arts in the past, and you've lived in Asia, and you've lived in China. Would you be interested in going with me? So we ended up deciding to go to China together. I said, maybe this is first step of the universe telling me where to go. <laughs> so, uh, so we decided to go out there for six months, went there for six months. And during that period of time, really was able to have some like time and distance to be able to think about what I wanted to do next and really had the clarity that I was not going to go back into politics and government was, uh, I had enough income, passive income from my businesses back home to be able to, uh, really kind of relocate anywhere in the world. And I always wanted to live in Paris, France. So I said, okay, I think I'm going to live in Paris, France. We had some French people studying Shaolin Kung Fu with me, um, at this, uh, this school in the mountains. 
And so I spoke with them a little bit about that and kind of got some perspective on what it would be like to live in Paris. I've spent a lot of time here over the years as well, uh, studying French from the age of five. Um, but uh, so I just made that decision. I was going to come out here. I spent some more time in Southeast Asia and uh, made the plan that I was going to take the train from Beijing, China to Paris, which is about a month <laughs> to get wow. from Beijing, China to Paris. But uh in order to stay in Paris, you need to be able to have a visa uh, if you want to stay here longer than three months, which is a tourist visa. And I was being a, you know, having a JD as well. You look at all the legal options that you possibly can do. <laughs> and uh, one of those legal options was to get a student visa. That seemed to be the easiest course of action for me at my age. And so I was thinking, oh, well, what can I study? And I really wasn't interested in studying politics or anything else like that I had previously studied. I have a JD and I have an MBA back home and I studied political science in the undergrad and media. So none of those really seemed appealing to me at one of the universities here. And then I really thought back, well, when was the last time you were passionate about something that was not politics or government? And I was 13 years old and I wanted to be a chef. And so I said, well, that seems like a pretty good place to be able to do that. You love cooking now. Uh, there's the Cordon Bleu, which is where Julia Child went. She was older than you, and uh, you should absolutely kind of check that out. So I did, and it you know, was an option. So I, I didn't tell them I was coming, but I flew, or not, not flew, I took the train, came into Paris, gave myself 10 days to find an apartment and to get into the school. I showed up at the school after I found my apartment and uh, told them, hey, I want to go here. And they said, okay, <laughs> classes start in a few months or a couple of months. I uh, really need to move on this quickly. And so we did. And I was able to get acceptance, had to go back to the U.S. for a few months to get my visa sorted out, and then flew in. And a couple weeks later, started classes at Cordon Bleu, both cuisine and pastry. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> let's, let's break that down a little bit. So um, yeah, sure. well, beyond, you know, being younger and, and recalling your passions, the reason we're, we're having this conversation is a lot of pharmacists have been talking lately about functional medicine. And mm -hmm. um, some even said that they would go back to culinary school too. So what was kind of the end game? Was it, is it just to live in Paris or for you, was it to learn how to re-engage with a passion? And then it no, kind it of- Oh, it's definitely re yeah. yeah. Extra yeah, it was definitely to re-engage with the passion. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely to re-engage with the passion, and it was, I mean, finding a new career, right? Yeah. So um, definitely decided that I wanted that new career to revolve around food and wine and beverages and every permutation of whatever that is. Uh, what that looks like down the road, I have no idea. I mean, right now, I love the idea of having a sandwich stand, but... Um, I have about 10, 15 different ideas of things that I would like to do with this. Uh, it's just finding kind of how those work out. I gave myself five to 10 years to just learn as much as I can and to experience and to practice before I get into a situation where I'm going to start putting money down or lining up investors or anything like that to, to create something. Um, and again, like having been a student for other other careers that's the way that I find works best for me to your earlier point as far as functional medicine and things I, I was raised by a doctor uh, who is a holistic she's a, a doctor of osteopathy family practitioner and she um, is very much uh, holistically minded so uh, in addition to being a doctor she's also a, she's a certified nutritionist and has really kind of like the whole whole approach to um, to medicine. So I, I was definitely brought up eating well, uh, learning about nutrition, learning about how everything works together. And uh, especially being here in France, where everything is just at the highest possible quality food wise. And they really care about making sure you know, sort of what it is that you're putting into your body and how you're putting it in there. Um, France gets a really bad rep for putting all this butter into your body here, but it's really good butter. <laughs> it's yeah. really good for you. So. <laughs> like, um, but you get what I'm saying? And it's actually interesting. Uh, there are lots of students, actually. Uh, I can think of about three that I met when I was doing my diplomas um, in cuisine and pastry that 
kind of just came for three months for one of like for the beginner for the first level of the cuisine program or the first level of the pastry program. Uh, and there, they were actually diet like going back to school for a dietitian. Um, they, you know, just finished their undergraduate program and diet, diet, um, being a dietitian and they were going back to get their masters and they wanted to be able to, um, actually learn how to make the food, uh, and have an actual culinary training before, going back and doing that masters because that was part of their approach. There were other folks that, um, a lot of people on their second careers or mid career, um, people that were taking sabbaticals. Uh, I, I was definitely on the older spec side of the spectrum of people at the school, but certainly not the oldest. I think we had people in their fifties, uh, sixties that were in the program. Um, and then you have people as young as what, 17, 18 years old who were there as well. So I was I was definitely on the upper upper end of the of the spectrum, but still not the oldest. Okay, AJ, let's live vicariously through you. Can you explain your course of study? You said you studied cuisine and pastry. How long was yeah. it? Um, well, how did you apply? Did you apply like a normal school here in the U.S.? And then what was kind of the course? Uh, was it you know very labor intensive? I, I would imagine yeah, it's it much like a lab, but. I could be wrong with that. Well, they've been doing it the same way for over a hundred years, right? So, I'm trying to think of when they started, 130 years, 140 years. I, I can't remember exactly when the Cornell started, but it was it was a long time ago. Um, but the program is pretty much the exact same way as it's always been. You do a demonstration where you watch the chef make something, and then you do the practical where you make it in the kitchen, and you get a list of ingredients. You write out how those ingredients are done, and then you uh, take those to the kitchen with you, and you try to recreate exactly the dish that was made by the, the chef. Uh, so that's that's pretty much just how that works uh, in virtually every program that they have at Cordon Bleu, is you have a demonstration, then you have the practical where you make it yourself, and then you can take home all the extras that you <laughs> have left over. All right, getting into Cordon Bleu, so um, it's it's pretty French. Like it's sink or swim. You have to show a passion for cooking. So they do have an application process that you write out sort of why you want to go to Cordon Bleu. Uh, you have to present your resume. You have to essentially pay the bill ahead of time. Uh, and it's, it's not cheap, but when you think of everything that you're getting along with what you're doing, so it actually, it ran me for doing both pastry and cuisine around $50,000 US. Wow. Um, and that's a nine month program, which is essentially a three year program that's been condensed into nine months. So I was in class 40 to 50 hours a week, pretty much nonstop for nine months. There was a, a break around Christmas that I had for a few weeks. And that was literally the longest period of time that I had. Uh, everything else was no longer than a week. There were days that I was in class six days a week, um, doing what I did, what's called the grand diploma or the, you know, the big, the big diploma because it's both cuisine and pastry. Okay. Uh, it is not easy. Like we are the, the small group of the people. Most people just do pastry or cuisine or do them back to back. They don't do them at the same time. Like we did. So of the people in the school of the 800 and something people in the school, I'd say maybe like 5% of us do what we were doing and 800 are in like all programs and everything like that. Um, so yeah, so cuisine and pastry. So three years of culinary school condensed into a nine month period. Uh, then you can do stages, which is essentially a food internship, like a, a kitchen internship okay. do that afterwards. And you can do that for up to a year. Um, you can do back to back six month if you do cuisine and pastry, or you can do, uh, it's up to a six month internship, I think, if you're just doing one or the other. Uh, and if it's over two months, you actually get paid, which is nice, but I, and it's not that much. I think I get paid about 570 euros a month for uh, my stages when I was working in the kitchen, uh, which is, again, nothing, but still, it, it's, it pays for <laughs> uh, groceries and a little bit of your rent here. Uh, but if it's less than two months, it can be unpaid. So did you do those well, stages afterwards? I did. I okay. graduated in June and three days later I started working at the restaurant 
uh, Berju, which is fantastic restaurant. It's actually owned by Americans in the Palais Royal, kind of behind where the Louvre Museum is in Paris. I had read about them in Entrepreneur Magazine years ago because uh, they had a really interesting story where they had a supper club and then they were Americans trying to bring or try, trying to do fine dining, like haute cuisine, like creative cooking in Paris when all the all the Parisians were like, oh, well, the, French, the Americans are invading Paris. So it's just a really interesting story. And I remember kind of bookmarking that and saying, hey, if I'm ever back in Paris, I should check these guys out. Of course, years later, I was in Paris. I'd completely forgotten about that until I came across that restaurant again and went there and ate, and it was phenomenal. And just was like, this is exactly what I want to be doing. This is, you know, the, the feel, the, the the food, just everything. And met with the owner, worked out to where I was going to be able to do a stage there, and um, yeah, graduated and <laughs> started working two three days later. Wow. So it sounds pretty labor intensive being in school there. It's pretty hardcore. So if somebody came back to you like you, who was a second career potential professional and really wanted to switch gears and, and go into the culinary arts, what mm -hmm. advice do you have for him or her? Well, I, I, yeah, just just to let you know. So, yeah, it's, it's hard, but I actually ended up graduating with two professional degrees, two professional baccalaureate degrees in France. So I can legally now I have a level, level of education where I can open up a pastry shop, for example, in France, because mm. I have the degree to do, be able to do that. I have a culinary degree. I have a pastry degree here. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, there is a payoff. It's not you're just not paying a bunch of money for, <laughs> for a nice little experience of learning how to cook. Like, it's, there is a diploma that is attached to that that is the highest level diploma that you can get with, within the culinary school sort of world. And France, and it applies throughout the world. Uh, okay, so your your next question was um, advice sorry, the for going advice. back to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's. I mean, the program is very unique, right? So it's it's not like lecture. It's lecture and demonstration. So you uh, just be prepared for kind of figuring out how your how you best learn along with that particular. Um, that particular teaching method. And as I understand, that's pretty standard throughout the culinary school world is you have a demonstration, then you have a practical. Okay. Um, so you're usually watching something be made and then you're making it shortly thereafter. So it, it's, it's unique in that it takes some time to get used to everybody's in the same boat as you are. So just, uh, figure out kind of what works best for you taking notes. I remember when I was starting out, I was just writing everything down. And then by the end, you're just kind of broad strokes of okay do this do this you worry less about you know exact measurements when you're doing cuisine you worry more about exact measurements but less about the process when you're doing pastry uh over time it it, it, it clicks now as far as different like switching careers like i said so i i completely left one career and went into this full-on for a second career um, there are a few other people that did the same thing, but we had people that were, um, that actually still were working their day job in the U S, uh, usually consultants, right? So they were able to work out some remote work program and, um, and then go to, go to classes during the day in France and then work in the evenings, which was during the day in the U S Okay. And so that, that, so if you can work out some kind of a remote work arrangement, uh, I would not recommend doing, I don't think there's any way you could do grand diploma and do something like that just because your time is, is cut. <laughs> yeah. You essentially, instead of 40 or 50 hours for the grand diploma, you're only doing about 20 hours a week, 15 to 20 hours a week. If you're just doing one of the diplomas, pastry or, or cuisine by themselves. So it's much more conducive to being able to work your day job or consult or do whatever it is that needs to be done. Uh, you can do the three month program, which is the basic level. You can come out and in, in chunks of time. A lot of people like will do three months and then they'll take six months off and they'll come back out and they'll do another three months or they'll do three months and they'll do like a one month intensive course and then they'll come back a year later and finish up the last program if they want to do the whole process and get a diploma. 
Um, it, it's really flexible, at least Cordon Bleu. I don't, I can't speak for other culinary schools, mm-hmm. but um, I, I can say that Cordon Bleu, being like the largest network, largest internationally, uh, and being kind of like the you know the original. Like they've, this is not their first rodeo. They know how to work with people. Like we had people that had to leave, um, mid program because their job back home required them to, uh, required them to like be back on full time. And they were able to work out with the school, how they could leave and then, you know, come back and restart and go again, paying like a very nominal, nominal fee to be able to do that. Okay. So they are flexible. And again, I, I, I can't speak for the other campuses, but I assume it's pretty much the same philosophy throughout. So if you had to do the culinary art program all over again, AJ, what would you have done differently, if anything? Oh, gosh. I'm glad that I did both together. I'm glad I did pastry and cuisine together. But... Um, there were times I was definitely hating my life. Like, mm. there, were pe- there were people that ended up with the same uh, same diplomas that I did that took uh, two years to do that instead of one year, and they seemed much happier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a lot more. I had a lot more time. Uh, you really, you really end up in a situation where you just don't really have a life for the nine months of this. And um, even like in law school, where I was in class all the time and doing the, I was doing my JD and my MBA at the same time, but there's just, you have weekends, you have like a schedule, you know, kind of what's going on. Culinary school is very unpredictable. No week is the same. No day is the same. You, uh, your schedule is all over the place and it's very difficult to plan a life around that when that's the case. Again, I don't know. I can't speak for other culinary schools, but uh, Cordon Bleu, that was very much the case. So just be prepared for that. And for me, I I wasn't quite as prepared. I had kind of all these grand ideas of being able to do little day trips on weekends and things like that, when in reality, I would come home and just be exhausted and not want to (laughs) go anywhere or do anything. So I I definitely was, uh, found myself sort of... um, stuck to Paris for a year and get a bit of cabin fever after a certain point for that. But, uh, I don't know if I would do it differently though. That being said, because it was really great just to knock all that out all at once. And I think it did help doing both at the same time because there's a lot of pastry and cuisine and there's just a lot of cuisine sort of elements within pastry. Uh, and it now frees me up to be able to, explore other programs that they have uh, over the next couple of years. So I have to ask, because this is a healthcare podcast, we have a bunch of healthcare professionals. France is allegedly or has the best healthcare system in the world. Have you experienced <laughs> any of the healthcare system there? And if so, how is it different than the U.S.? I mean, I, uh, so it's re- you're required to buy insurance here. So like day one of going to school, they have the representatives that come in and say, if you're under a certain age, you have to have social security. If you're over a certain age, you have to buy private insurance. Okay. So I was over that age. (laughs) So I had to buy private insurance. I think I pay like 300 something euros a year and I have 100% coverage (laughs) over everything. Wow. Which is crazy. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, I think I also get like a 200, 200 euro or 300 euro credit for eyeglasses, which is convenient because I lost my glasses the day I arrived in Paris uh, last year. But I haven't actually taken advantage of any of these things because I, I rarely get ill, but um, and I just haven't gone in to get glasses or anything like that. But that includes dental as well. Uh, but they, again, I have like the Cadillac plan of, of the insurance. Uh, that being said, also, like I can just go downstairs to the pharmacy that's next door to where I live and just kind of tell them what's wrong with me. And they give me some kind of a drug without a prescription, <laughs> without a prescription. And it seems to work. So, uh, it, it's, it's pretty, they, they know what they're doing. It's, it's super easy. Um, the pharmacist, like everything is right there. Yeah. You don't have to, you don't have to wait. They just have it. They have it ready to go. Um, uh, there's, uh, but again, like I, I've had minor colds 
and like maybe like chest colds and things like that. That's as bad as it's gotten for me here. Uh, thank God. But, um, <laughs> uh, but I have other friends that have just had a fantastic experience here with, um, uh, with their healthcare like experience. Uh, but yeah, just from the insurance itself and from my time in the pharmacies and just kind of hearing other people's stories about pharmacies, like it's, it's, yeah, I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. All right, AJ. So where can people find you online? Sure thing. Um, I have a website that will be coming out shortly, but in the meantime, uh, easiest way to kind of get an idea of what I'm doing, what food I'm making, um, where I'm eating, that stuff is my Instagram. And that is just my name, AJ Feeney Ruiz, all one word on Instagram. And then that is usually a good portal to be able to get to everywhere else. So you can follow me on there. You can just check out kind of what I'm doing. Um, the restaurant where I was working, uh, I'll give that for you for the notes and everything like that. But that's Verju, and I think they're VerjuParis.com. Okay. Uh, as well, and yeah, so uh, be happy to give you all that stuff offline as well, so you can include it in the notes. Awesome. Well, I live vicariously through your Instagram because you're always posting what you're making. <laughs> I want to jump through and eat it all. So, <laughs> yeah, sure thing. <laughs> AJ, thanks for being part of the Pharmacy Podcast. So, are you sure ready thing. for the speed round? I'm ready for the speed round. Let's all right. Round. What books are you reading right now? A lot of cookbooks. <laughs> I'm looking at my I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. I have probably about ten different cookbooks that I'm going through right now. Um, about half between pastry and half uh, um, half cuisine. I have several in French. Most are in English. But yeah, that's 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 my world of books right now. What podcasts are you listening to? <laughs> I've been listening to Here Be Monsters a lot lately, and I always listen to This American Life. What's your favorite spot in Paris? Uh, sunset on the steps of Montmartre, just below Sacre Coeur. If there's a beautiful day, it's like the entire city turns pink, like for one specific second. And it's amazing. What's your source of inspiration for cooking and baking? Uh, I spend a lot of time on Pinterest. I'm not proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the best career advice you ever received? I was working in my first, um, uh, Washington DC job and I, I came into work and I was I was really hurting from a, a large night out and my boss uh, brought me in he said best advice I can ever give you is play through pain and that applies to everything especially even working in the kitchen you just always need to just power through no matter what sort of pain you're in just play through it and get to the other end Play through pain. Well, with that, AJ Feeney Ruiz, thank you for being part of the Pharmacy Podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to another edition of Back to School RX, our mini series on pharmacists returning to graduate school and school to further their education and or make career pivots. We invite you throughout this mini series if you have questions to tweet us over at Aaron L. Albert, that's my Twitter handle, or of course, Pharmacy Podcast, and use our official hashtag with your question, hashtag back to school RX. We're going to try to do our best to address any questions that you have about turning or returning to graduate school or school during this mini series. Again, my name is Aaron Albert. You can reach me over at my website as well, AaronAlbert.com. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.